Silicon Valley Fireside Chat with Robert Polak from, uh, from SV Angel and Aldo Lou Dennis from 137 Ventures. Uh, we can go ahead and sit, yeah. So please welcome to join us on the main stage for, for the discussion. So I, th I think it'd be great to start with a quick overview of your, your firms and your, your focus. I know we've had a chat, but just to let everyone know kind of the angle you're coming from. And Sure. So uh, 137 Ventures is a San Francisco-based fund. Uh, we're on our third fund, which is a $200 million fund that we closed late last year. We invest primarily in growth stage companies. Uh, so we also do uh, some secondary investment as well as primary investment. Um, so I work at SV Angel. Um, we're an angel fund focused on early stage consumer um, internet software companies. So uh, the firm was started by Ron Conway. Um, and as a fund, we, we tend to invest pretty frequently. We do about 65 to 70 deals a year, um, but write smaller check sizes. We had a short chat. Is this on? We had a short chat earlier this afternoon about uh, some of the things you look for when you're going to do investments. And I thought this was really interesting to kind of open that up a little bit for the audience here, because I know we have a room full of startups who are looking to get investments. A lot of them are interested in the U.S. market. I know, Robert, you and I had chatted a little bit about four criteria you have, and I'd love to, for you to open that up a little bit and then for us to have some, some responses from Alda as well. Yeah, sure. Um, so what we talked about is, um, I guess it's more our internal process, um, and we kind of look at kind of four key pillars or areas um, at deals. So um, to kind of start, I think um, as a fund, all of our deals kind of come in through referral sources. So for us, that referral source is like that first kind of filter and that first kind of area where we look at in terms of um, companies and things like that. Um, so if you think about us as a firm, um, between Ron Conway and SV Angel together, we've probably invested in close to 900 companies over the last 20 years. Take that times two founders, that's 1,800 founders alone from a kind of founder referral network um, sending us deals. So when we evaluate things, it's, it's that referral and that kind of warm introduction um, to a founder that's kind of really important for us um, kind of as a first filter. Um, from there, kind of the other three things that we talked about was um, team being super important. Um, and then there's various kind of things within that. Um, we don't lead rounds. Like I said, our check size are pretty small, relatively speaking. Um, on average, you're somewhere between kind of 100 to 300K. And so um, for us, really important is this strategic syndicate kind of that the other investors that kind of are along with the round. Um, and then last, kind of the space, right? I mean, it, it, we always kind of still invest kind of in kind of high growth areas and, and things that are exciting. Sure. So my fund has a slightly later stage focus. Uh, we're looking for companies that are, um, have already found product market fit, are growing rapidly, uh, and are already generating revenue. Um, and those are sort of necessary but not sufficient criteria. I think the most important criteria is that the company has um, this sort of intangible quality of getting necessarily better as it gets bigger. And so you see that dynamic with companies that have a, um, a marketplace dynamic, a network effect, uh, data asymmetry, sort of the typical consumer example there is, is Google. You know, the more people that use it, the better the click-through information is there, um, or even just an economy of scale. And so that can apply to a broad, a broad range of businesses that sort of, you know, as they get bigger, their cost of capital goes down um, and their cost of production goes down. And so, you know, beyond just sort of being at the right stage, we also want that quality where if we're wrong about the founding team, it, it doesn't really quite matter as much because as, as long as we're right about the growth, that company is necessarily going to be getting better just by virtue of the fact that it's continuing to grow and stick around. And I, think, I think it's really interesting because you think about someone coming from Finland and looking into getting an investment in, in the Silicon Valley in particular. It feels like it's this huge space, there's a, a lot of ground to cover, it can feel like a bit of a mystery. And, you both talked about the importance of referrals when, you're, when a company approaches and you even begin to look at it. How does someone from Finland or anywhere in the Nordics, how do they then 
begin to build relationships so that they would be in a position to get a referral to some, from someone who knows you. It can feel like a long stretch. Yeah. I mean, it's a long way. And, and I, I do want to kind of preface one thing just to be clear. I mean, um, as a fund, we're focused entirely kind of on, on the U.S. investments and things like that. Um, but I do think the, you know, great companies are being started everywhere. And so seeing that, um, I mean, for us, I think, one, it's just being relentless, right? And that's a huge characteristic that you're looking for in a founder anyway, um, one that's building a company and, and just really kind of trying to open up doors and, and, and break those connections. I mean, for us, um, it's our job to be out there and to be public and to be available. And so it's not, I think, that difficult to, in some cases, just find an introduction, right? Sure, and I think, you know, part of it is sort of why we've come out you know, all the way out here is because we want to start to follow a companies early, you know, and start to track who the founders and entrepreneurs are and the areas that people are focusing on um, to build that relationship. And I think, you know, part of it is when the company here is at the point where they might raise capital from Silicon Valley coming out there and, you know, asking everyone that you talk to for introductions. And I think you'll find that everyone is very, very generous with introductions if they've been able to meet you, um, whether it's at an event or um, you know, at, at a bar or, or anything, just sort of talking to folks because most people are in, in the same business or know people that are in the business. Um, and it is sort of being, you know, having that hustle, that sort of relentlessness in terms of sort of getting out there and you know, shaking hands. Go ahead. Yeah, I was about to say, I think the group that I've seen do probably the best job in the Valley is Seed Camp, um, at least at the early stage in terms of on a continuous basis, kind of bringing a handful of companies out and trying to get them in front of as many kind of early stage investors and in some capacity, um, a few times a year even. I think they've just done a really good job of from, from Europe trying to create a presence and an awareness of their companies kind of there. Definitely, and I think, you know, you both said, alluded to be brave, be bold, be yeah. early. And I think this also leads into this conversation of you know, when do you begin to start trying to get an attention from an investor and it's not when you need the money like oh my goodness I need to close in six months it's you know, when do you start building a relationship how early does that begin and I think that's something we talked about as well is is you have to start greasing the wheel greasing the skids a lot earlier than than that because desperation doesn't look good and also it takes a lot longer than you may think is I would say absolutely yeah uh, I think the, the, other, the other area I think is is really important to discuss as well is you both touched on, on the idea of team and you know, the idea of a relentless founder. But it's, it's, the founder is one piece, and I'd like to go in, into that first, but then follow on that. Um, does it, is it just a single founder? Is that the best, the, the, the best way to build a company? When does it make sense to bring on a co-founder? When does it make sense to bring on a co-founding team? What's your experience in, in those areas? Sure. I mean, I think I, I personally have a bias towards a smaller founder team, uh, you know, one or two individuals. Obviously, it's, you know, important to have someone in our industry who's a, a technical co-founder, um, and that's sort of the crux of the team. And, you know, once you get the product built, you can start to worry about distribution and marketing and business development. But obviously, you have to start with, you know, a compelling product that's solving, you know, a, a problem that is, uh, you know, is widespread. And, and uh, so I think... You know, the founding team is obviously important, and, and once you figure out and find that product market fit, I think that's the time that you would want to expand the team um, into, you know, a, a broader sort of non-technical group. Yeah, I mean, I think Alda nailed it. I think, I mean, for us, I think a big key in the, in the company um, is having that kind of technical background, because especially, it, it, depending upon the company, it, it matters a little bit more or less, but, but it's really something kind of we look for. Um, and if not, you have to have some ability to attract um, talent and technical people and things like that. Um, I think in terms of like size, it, it's tough because, so we're investors in Airbnb and if you think, if you look at the three founders there, it's, I think it's a rare that you have three co-founders that are all equally like talented and able to work together. And um, you know, Brian's grown into being the kind of the CEO there, but kind of, CT Nate is kind of the CTO and, and Joe Gebbi and those guys. I think that's more rare to find three people that really work so well together and equally. Um, but I also think it's tougher to kind of start a company on your own um, as a single co-founder. 
Um, I think they're just finding that support and things like that is it's easier to do that with somebody uh, with a co-founder. So that leads us to the that leads us to the question of founder dynamics, right? How well do people get along? How how do you assess that? How does a, a founder or a person who wants to begin a, a startup? How do you vet out your co-founders? Do you have any advice on that or any insight on on? It's it's not always an easy job. <laughs> no, and I think. <laughs> I don't know. I haven't personally started a company yet, um, and I don't think you know. I have the most respect for anyone that that does because I think it's you know one of the hardest things you could possibly do, um, and so um, I, I think it's tough. You know, I think you know finding, you know, you're going to go through hell and high water, and so finding somebody that like, you know, you're able to communicate really well with. Um, it was funny. I was talking to one of our companies um, last week, and. Um, one of the founders said, you know, the best advice I've gotten from anybody is to have, you know, literally relentlessly every night they check in and even if it's a five minute conversation or so. But, you know, as a company grows, it's a lot harder to realize what everybody's kind of doing and what your co-founders are doing and what parts. Um, and so I just think like, you know, over communicating and, and finding somebody that that you kind of, you really work well together. Because, I mean, to what Alda said when we were talking earlier, it's, it's a marriage, right? Um, and so, you know, in terms of finding the perfect partner, it should be someone that you have that relationship of trust with, and that also, which frequently you can only develop over a number of years, and having gone through stresses with that person or the, or, or your other, you know, or the other persons that you founded the team with. And I think how you react to stress, how you react, react to adversity directly speaks to how you will perform, you know, with the stresses of your company and, and respond to those stresses and be able to, you know, pivot and, and respond to what market dynamics will throw at, at your company. Are you moving together in the same direction? And I think that's another big question is they can seem like the right fit from a skill standpoint. But are, is there heart in the business? I think that's a big question too is, do they like the idea of entrepreneurship or do they like the idea of solving the problem maybe that you're, you're out there to solve? Yeah, I mean, they have to have the same vision for the company, right? right? And, and be moving it in the right, same direction, yeah. for sure. So we've, we've looked at getting a referral. You've, you've, you've got your syndicate, your potentially potential other investors. You're looking at the team. Now we get to how that pitch actually comes across. So it's, it's not the pitch before the introduction, it's once you've decided to see them. What kind of stuff are you looking for? What kind of advice can you give in terms of what do you need from the, the group of people or the, the teams that you're, you're examining as to whether or not they're worth your money? I mean, I think the first question that I like to ask of an early stage company is sort of what is the problem that you're solving? Um, and you know, that I, I frequently describe as sort of, you know, sell me on you and sell me on the dream, but if you sell the dream compellingly enough, then that also speaks to your own character in terms of your talent at you know, being able to recruit, raise money, find customers. All those things come from you know, basically that sort of inner determination that, you've, that we hear a lot of uh, venture capitalists talk about, that they're sort of trying to gauge uh, in terms of you as a founder and an entrepreneur is whether or not you'll be able to you know, persevere. I was just going to ask all the how important is background for you, you know, and at I what point? I don't think it's really about the background. I think it's really about character. Um, I, you know, I, I worked for Peter Thiel for many years, and he, he thought that college was overvalued. And so, you know, it really is about sort of, you know, your resourcefulness and your, your ability to, you know, overcome adversity and also how compelling you are as, you know, a salesperson and a motivational person for the culture of your team. One of the things we really kind of look at is like we kind of refer to this thing as founder market fit, right? And so um, I think that embodies a bunch of different things, but it's kind of um, different. I think different founders are suited differently for the types of companies, and that's where I think really kind of to what Aldo was talking about is is why are they starting a company and where the inspiration come from? Is this something they've thought about for a long period of time? Is this a issue they've been trying to solve for a long period of time, or um, kind of where, where that inspiration came from. And then um, I agree, I think like background matters to some extent because of how it sets you up to kind of solve that problem. Um, and that can take on various forms. Education I don't think is 
one of them. <laughs> <laughs> or it doesn't have to be. It depends. Right. It depends. <laughs> it well, it depends, depends on the company, right? <laughs> Let's talk a little bit about sectors that you guys are looking at and, and trends you're seeing in terms of markets that are starting to really shape up and become exciting, things that you think are maybe slightly underrated at the moment, but you think are going to explode. Can we kind of open up, open up that a little bit? Yeah, I mean, we, um, so I talk about kind of we invest pretty broadly. Um, we've always been very kind of consumer focused um, in our funds. Um, and um, with that in mind, kind of, so, we differ kind of probably a little bit from traditional VCs in the sense that, you know, I think traditional VCs will pick, call it 10 to 15 companies in a given year and invest fairly heavily in each one of those companies. We tend to pick, you know, eight to 10 sectors and invest heavily in each one of those sectors um, and hope that, you know, one or two out of the 10 companies we invest in that sector are a breakout company. Um, and so with that, as a fund, we've always taken a very kind of bottoms up approach to our investing. Um, we don't want to kind of get in the business of predicting the future necessarily. Mm -hmm. um, and so we really let kind of our deal flow dictate where we invest and, and what we're looking at. Um, and that's where kind of, again, I think at the early, especially at the early stage, I think the most important thing for an investor is deal flow. Um, without great deal flow, I think it's, you know, it's a tough business as it is, but, uh, but I think it's um, it just you're at a huge disadvantage, um, and so within that, you know, we do one of two things. One is we we look at our founders and ask them what they are interested, what they're working on. Mm -hmm. um, but then we also really kind of let, kind of, with our deal flow, kind of let areas bubble up that that kind of come up through that. Where you know over a three month period or so, we see ten similar companies in a certain space, and this light bulb goes off and says, okay let's pay attention here, something's happening, because 10 really smart people are all kind of working on a similar problem. I can imagine you've got 1,800 founders that have access and networks that relate to all aspects of, of the industry and, and, and looking at potentially giving you tips on, hey, here's something to watch, here's an area to watch, where you can kind of get an, an eye on the ball before it's really that, gone mainstream. That, that's the hope, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sure. So, you know, in terms of sector, you know, we tend not to be specifically focused on sector, but rather focused on the stage of the company. But I think that there are a whole host of technologies that haven't been rebuilt for, you know, our day and age. And, you know, those are the types of companies that we, we tend to think have a lot of potential. Mm -hmm. um, you know, examples of that are sort of, you know, payroll systems in the United States are, are antiqu antiquated and have been for many years. So we have an investment in a company called Gusto that um, has basically sort of, you know, rebuilt that technology and allowed the data inputs to be, you know, done electronically rather than, you know, via faxes and, um, you know, sort of more traditional means. And, you know, we, we're both sort of interested in a company called Flexport that is looking at, um, shipping and I think that's a, a you know an area that's uh, that's, that, that, that's interesting <laughs> here and so um, you know I think there's all the sorts scene. of those types of technologies that I find very fascinating you know point of sale systems yeah. you know technologies that affect us on a daily basis but have not really been rebuilt and put in the cloud um, are things that I'm particularly interested in um, another sector is is healthcare uh, you know in the United States our healthcare system mm -hmm. is um, is lacking in many ways and very inefficient. Yeah. And so there's many, many different ways that you know, particular companies have tackled one portion of that. Um, you know, for example, one company called PillPack that I'm looking at is, is sort of packaging up pills. And if anybody has sort of aging parents and you know, an aging population mm -hmm. as we all do, the, you know, those pills are, tend to get more and more voluminous as you get older. And there are many of them on a daily basis that you need to take and they package them you know, by the day rather than by the type of medication. Um, and, and ship them to you, and it's essentially a pharmacy um, that's sort of supply chain in integrated. And so those types of things where they're basically rebuilding something that we know it's a big problem that really just hasn't been modernized um, are the types of country, uh, companies that we've been more particularly interested in. I think that's really interesting too because I think with digitization it's allowed us to see technologies bubbling up that through digitization are disrupting old ways of, of working but also surprising us in what we're capable of managing ourselves. So the individuals coming in and they want more transparency there before from, from a lot of the services that have been you know, healthcare traditionally provided, but they also want to be able to, to take more responsibility. And I think that that's, that's something that 
we're seeing here as well in the Nordics is, is a lot of companies focusing on those sorts of solutions. Let's talk valuation for a moment. <laughs> so what, when, how, do you, how do you measure that? How do you, how do you calculate what kind of valuation you give a company in an investment? What should start, startup founders expect? It's easier for what I do because there tend to be, you know, comps in the public market. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more difficult from, you know, an early stage that, that Robert would focus on in terms of, you know, what I, I, would, I would tend to think that the type of valuations that you are seeing are based on entirely what the market will bear. Yeah, I mean, I think valuations are, there's, there's two things. One is, I think people oftentimes obsess over valuation too much, right? Mm -hmm. And that's both on the investor side and the founder side. Yeah. Um, I think, you know, if it's going to be a big company, it's going to be a big company and it doesn't really matter arguing about and trying to over-optimize um, over valuation. But I think, um, I mean, different things do kind of play in. Um, I think the founder's background, if it's a repeat entrepreneur, um, they obviously can command a much higher valuation. Um, if the product is further along and enough is mm -hmm. built versus kind of, you know, pre-product or stuff like that. Um, so some of those things just kind of determine where that, where, where things are. And then the area and the space sometimes do too, right? Right. Um, so. Great. So are there any questions in the audience at this stage in the conversation? There's glaring lights, so I'll try to, to see if there's a hand out there. We, we do have a roaming mic. Anyone? Are we awake out there? <laughs> All right, so we'll, we'll continue on the conversation. But if you do, I'll try to take note, and if you raise a hand at some point, um, feel free to, to ask a question. Great, so here we are. You've made the long trip across the water to, to the Nordics. What's your view of what's going on in Europe generally, the Nordic scene? How does that look from, from where you are in Silicon Valley? Yeah, I mean, I think to what Alda said, I mean, I think, you know, it's prudent given everything that's happening here mm -hmm. to start keeping an eye out in terms yeah. of what's happening. I think, you know, there's obviously, um, I think great companies can be started and can be built kind of anywhere. Um, I mean, our view, again, we, we primarily focus only kind of on the U.S. and that's a reflection of resources based on our team, the size of the team. Mm -hmm. um, it's also kind of where the majority of our network is and where we can add the most value to companies, right? Um, with that said, I think, you know, um, I think there's certain things that make the Valley unique in terms of an ecosystem and a very mature ecosystem that I think is, will be interesting to see how that develops in Europe, especially because Europe is, it's still, at least from our po my point of view, feels like a very fragmented market um, to some extent. Um, and that's kind of, I think, could be a disadvantage for some companies that only end up kind of focusing on local markets mm -hmm. um, or it's a lot more difficult to kind of look at Europe as a or trying to tackle Europe as a kind of cohesive um, yeah. cohesive market. No, I think you were talking about valuations earlier and you know in terms of finding value as an investor and finding um, you know outsized returns you do have to tend to look places where other people aren't looking. And I think, you know, we've been increasingly spending more time in Europe because, you know, I think it's an area where there isn't as much venture activity, certainly not by, you know, any, any, any measure. And so, you know, I, I'm really on the lookout for sort of those up and coming companies, those hidden gems. And, you know, uh, you know, especially with some of our maturing companies, they're also looking to expand into Europe. And so I think understanding the market, even though it may be fragmented, um, is useful to being helpful to our portfolio companies as well. Great. Um, are there any things that, any tips that you can give to the, the audience? Again, I mean, Nordics, are, it's a pretty small area, but it's growing. There's, like you said, it's fragmented, but at the same time, I know there's a lot of work being done between the different uh, startup communities within the Nordics to, to cross-pollinate, to, to, to uh, help each other out in terms of best practices and so on. But it's always really interesting to get, you know, from Silicon Valley, it's a much more mature yeah. investor market, it's a much more mature startup market. The access to uh, potential customers is, is easier because the United States tends to be a bit more homogenous. Are there things you can share with us that you think perhaps could help someone as they go to grow from any of the small countries in the Nordics that we're, we're in now to, to be a global player in the market space? Advice for entrepreneurs in terms of how to be a global player? Yes. 
Um, you know, I think it, we've talked, we hit, about, hit on a lot of the points before, yeah. which is, you know, broadening your network, sort of always be on the lookout for, you know, opportunities to meet new people mm -hmm. and, um, and sort of network th with the right folks. Um, you know, obviously that doesn't just pertain to, you know, investors, but also strategic business partners that you could have in, in various jurisdictions, which can be helpful to sort of entering into, into different markets. Um, you know, I know in particular, for example, China, you really have to have a strategic partner right. in order to operate there. Um, and I think that, that it's helpful to have sort of business partnerships that can help you grow and expand. Great. Very good. So ask you one, one more time if there are any questions from the audience. We have a few minutes left to take, take some questions. We've got a really no quiet questions. crowd today. Yeah. <laughs> Hello, Helsinki. We'll have it. <laughs> and you can call on people. <laughs> I can't really see if there's anyone, anyone out there. Okay. Well, it's certainly, certainly warm enough under, the, under these lights. And I, I think we, <laughs> we, could, we could take a, maybe a, a few closing statements or comments from, from you guys and uh, then let ourselves get out into the, the fresh air. Yeah, I mean, for, for us, I mean, for me at least, and then for all the two, I think that, you know, this is the first time we've actually been up here in the Nordics and things like that. And I think it's really exciting and um, you know, walking in here and seeing everybody yeah. and, uh, and kind of the energy that, that, that's going on here um, and just in terms of talking with people and, um, you know, this isn't a, it, it's not a conference that previously we kind of heard before and yeah. it's, it looks like there's a ton going on and, and so it's really exciting to see in different parts of the world kind of all that energy. Absolutely. You know, I, I would just say, I would encourage you guys to, you know, reach out to me or Robert, especially if you happen to be in the Silicon Valley area, and we'd be happy to meet and sit down and, and help, you know, sort of guide you through sort of, you know, what funds to talk to, who to talk to, that sort of thing. And I think I'm always happy to talk to entrepreneurs and get to know folks early on, especially the ones that are doing the work to actually um, get, their, get themselves out there. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Alden, Thank Robert. You. Let's please give a warm right. applause, a thank you to both of them.